Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Izzy from PowerliftingWin.com, and today we're going to talk about how to deadlift. Both the conventional and sumo style will be covered, and it's going to be a discussion taking place from the perspective of how best to deadlift for the sport of powerlifting, which of course means moving the most weight possible. So what we're going to start off with is a, a basic overview of both movements, how to set up for them and execute them, and then we're going to go ahead and break down every little detail from that base overview perspective. So let's start with the conventional deadlift. Okay, so the conventional deadlift has five basic steps. And here's the setup that you can go through to basically have the exact same deadlift every single time. Something completely repeatable and something that 100% adheres to the model that we've already presented, which means the bar's over the middle of the foot, the scapula's directly under the bar, the hips are at the right height, the lats and the humerus are at the right relationship, and you can do all of that with a basic setup that doesn't involve all sorts of crazy thinking and calculations. So here's how it goes. You're going to take a stance with your shins about one inch away from the bar. That's going to put the bar directly over the middle of your foot. Not the middle of the front part of your foot that you can see, but the middle of your whole foot. You're going to take approximately a vertical jump stance, okay? And that's step one. Just take your stance. Don't move the bar. We need to keep the bar right over the middle of the foot, right? That's why we took our stance the way we did, because it's over the middle of the foot, and we're going to keep it there for the rest of our setup. So the second step you're going to do is you're going to take your grip. Just go ahead and let your arms hang vertically. They need to be as straight as possible. Keep your hips up in the air when you take your grip, and don't move the bar. Leave the bar right over the middle of your foot. The third step is that you're going to drop your knees until your shins touch the bar. Now, this is a hard part for some because you're going to want to knock the bar forward with your shins. Do not do that. We need to keep the bar directly over the middle of the foot because that's where it's most efficient. So you're going to drop your shins to the bar without moving the bar. Just drop them until there's contact and then stop. Don't push the bar forward. Step number four is that with your knees forward, with your grip set, only now are you going to squeeze your back up into extension, okay? And you have to do this without pushing your knees forward more and knocking the bar off of your midfoot balance point. So that this is really the most difficult step. Squeeze your chest up without moving the bar. Now, if you're a round back puller, you don't necessarily need to do that. Uh, it's up to you. I know round back pullers who set their back and only round as much as they need to for a given pull. And I know round back pullers like, say, Konstantinin Konstantinovs who sets up round for every single pull that he does. You have to develop your own style on that. My personal opinion is that if you round a lot on any heavy deadlift, you should warm up with a rounded back. And so you should just skip step four. All right. Step number five is you're going to take the slack out of the bar, especially if you're using a deadlift bar. We'll talk more about what that means later. Take a big breath, drag the bar up your shins, and stand up completely normally at lockout. Okay? And those are the five steps. So now I'm going to walk you through this whole process step by step in real time. Step one, take your stance. Remember, approximately vertical jump stance width. Step number two, take your grip. Arm should be as vertical as possible. Step number three, drop your knees forward to the bar without knocking the bar forward. Step number four, squeeze your chest up without knocking the bar forward. And last but not least, take a big breath and actually pull the bar. So here's the chart one last time in case you wanted to see it one, once more. Um, it's really simple. You're going to take a stance where the bar is directly over the middle of your foot. Then you're going to take your grip without moving the bar. Then you're going to drop your shins to the bar without moving the bar. Then you're going to set your back. You're going to squeeze that chest up without moving the bar. And finally, you're going to take the slack out of the bar, get a big breath, drag the bar up your shins, and stand up to lock out the pole. So I'm sure you're saying, okay, well, what about sumo? You know, sumo is supposed to be so much more technical than the conventional deadlift. I think the truth is, is that a lot of people just don't use technique on the conventional deadlift, and you can't do that with sumo. But realistically, they're both technical movements, 
and there's not a tremendous amount of difference between the two. That said, there is at least one really important difference in the sumo deadlift setup and one really important difference in the sumo deadlift execution. So here we're going to focus on the setup. Step number one is still take your stance. Ideally, your toes will be all the way out to the plates, but you might not be able to do that, and we'll discuss specifics later. Step number two, exactly the same. Take your grip, don't move the bar. Step number three, also the same. Drop your shins to the bar without moving the bar. Here's where we have our new step. Step number four is push your knees out all the way out in line with your toes. They don't have to be past in line with your toes or your ankles, but they need to be at least out that far. Technically, in the conventional deadlift, you also push your knees out, but because your arms are so close to your legs, you don't really push them out to any appreciable degree. In the sumo deadlift, getting your knees out is one of the most important aspects of the whole thing. We'll talk about more later, but this is a critical step. Many people skip it or they just can't do it, and it's one of the big reasons why a lot of people don't get uh, as much weight. They can't move as much weight sumo. The next step is exactly the same. Squeeze your chest up. Don't move the bar. And as before, the last step is to actually pull the bar. So if you're paying attention here, the only the real big differences in the sumo setup is that obviously the stance width, right? But you're also going to have to set up a little bit closer to the bar because your foot is going to end up more turned out than it is on a conventional deadlift. And because your foot is more turned out, the middle of your foot ends up being needing to be closer to the bar than it is when your foot is turned straight. So instead of setting up about an inch away, you really set up closer to like half an inch away. You can easily verify this just by looking down at your foot to, to make sure that the bar is directly over the middle of your foot. And obviously the next big difference is the really the, the real emphasis on getting your knees out. That's, that's not as big of a cue in the conventional deadlift. It is on the squat, right? And in the sumo deadlift, getting your knees out is just as important as it is on the squat. You have to get your knees out. And like I said, there is one difference in the execution, and it has to do with basically your firing patterns. In the conventional deadlift, your, your knees and hips can lock out at the same time. In the sumo deadlift, that's not necessarily true. And we're going to get into that when we get to the execution phase later on in the video. Okay, now I want to actually cover specific elements of the deadlift setup. So we're going to talk about things like foot position, stance width, grip width, and we're going to discuss the nitty gritty details of how to optimize all these little variables. Though it may seem like sort of a strange place to start given our you know five step, six step setup for each of the types of pulls, we're going to start off talking about grip width. And the reason why is because arm length is the primary determinant of deadlift leverages. The longer your arms are, the better your leverages are for the deadlift. And the fact of the matter is, is there's nothing, there's nothing you can really do to make your arms longer in terms of deadlift technique, besides rounding your back, which helps at the beginning only. But, but re realistically, you can't change the segment length of your arm to make it longer. What you can do, and what a lot of people do, is they use techniques that make their arms effectively shorter. And we, we need to avoid that at all costs. Okay, so let's take a look at an example of two different grip widths, a, a very close grip and a very wide grip, and see what's going on. So on the left here, we have the lifter with completely vertical arms, and on the right, the arms are held at a, a big diagonal and nearly a snatch grip. Now, why is the alignment on the left pre preferable? Well, the reason why it's preferable is because when the arms hang vertically, this maximizes the distance that they can cover. The you know, it's the old saying, you know, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Well, if you have a straight line, it's going to cover more distance than a line of the exact same length that it is at a diagonal. So basically, we, basically we get the full length of our arms when they hang vertically. When they hang diagonally, it adds range of motion to the pull. And you can clearly tell that by where the bar is locking out relative to the white shirt. Now, when you take a wider grip, it, it not only adds range of motion to the top of the pole, but it adds range of motion to the bottom of the pole as well. So you have to think of it like this. 
what can you use more weight on? A one inch deficit deadlift, a two inch deficit deadlift, or a pull from the floor? How about this? Where, what can you lock out more weight with? A snatch grip deadlift, a clean grip deadlift, or your normal grip deadlift? The answer in, in, all, in, in both cases is going to be the deadlift from the floor and the deadlift with your normal grip. So when you take a wider grip, what you're essentially doing is making both ends of the pull harder. The number one determinant uh, of your technique, realistically, in terms of stance width and things like that, comes down to making sure that your arms are as long as possible relative to your other segment lengths. So the first signifier of good technique in the deadlift is that you're keeping those arms vertical. One of the advantages of the sumo deadlift compared to the conventional deadlift is that you can actually get more vertical arms with the sumo deadlift. And the reason for that is pretty simple. When you pull conventionally, your legs have to go inside of your arms. And in order to keep your legs at a reasonable distance from each other, normally you have to put your arms at least a tad bit wider to just fit your legs inside of them. Well, with sumo, since your legs are outside of your arms, you can realistically put your arms wherever you want. One of the things that a lot of people do is that they put their hands fully on the knurling. Now, if you have grip troubles or if you have troubles activating your lats all the way, this can be a fine solution to those problems. But it's still suboptimal because you're making your arm shorter. So take a look at the picture on the right. Okay, That is me trying to grip the bar with my hands fully on the knurling. The picture on the left shows me using a half and half grip. That means two fingers on the knurling, two fingers off. I'm a relatively short guy at 5'6", so if you're a bit bigger, you might want to try one finger on, or I mean one finger on the smooth and the rest on the knurling. But the reality is, is that for almost everybody, in order to produce vertical arms, you're going to need to have a finger or two on the smooth part of the bar. Only really big lifters are going to be an exception to this. For vertical arms, one more time, you need fingers on the smooth. So with our discussion of grip width out of the way, this leads us into stance width, which is really a more logical place to start, but we just had to discuss grip width first because it influences stance width. So let's take a closer look at both the conventional stance width and the sumo stance width. So as I've alluded to earlier, one of the determinants of your conventional stance width is the fact that you need to keep your arms as vertical as possible, and you also still need to keep your legs at a good power base. So in the conventional deadlift amongst powerlifters, it actually isn't that uncommon to see everything from people practically having their heels touching together to people standing wide enough to, to, you know, to use a squat stance. And realistically, you want to keep those arms as vertical as you can. So if you're one of those people who can successfully use a stance that's really narrow, it is going to help you keep those arms more vertical. So it's something to consider. A super close conventional deadlift can work, especially if it allows you to keep the arms vertical. But for most people, you're going to have the most power from approximately a vertical jump stance with your heels 6 to 12 inches apart or so. And from there, you really want to get the arms as vertical as possible without having your thumbs jam into your legs on the way up and create unnecessary friction. So start with the vertical jump stance, and depending on you know your build, you'll tweak it a little bit from there. Now, lifters often have questions about what is the appropriate or the optimal stance width for the sumo deadlift. Well, in, in an ideal world, the optimal stance width is with your toes all the way out to the plates. And this is because the wider that you can stand, the more the, the closer your hips are going to be to the bar for one. Because remember, the reason we're taking a wider stance is to effectively shorten the length of the, the thigh segment. And the wider that we can stand, the more we can hold that thigh at a diagonal angle, the greater diagonal angle we can hold it at. So the wider we go, the shorter our thighs are effectively within the system and the closer we get our hips to the bar, which just improves our leverage. Additionally, the wider you stand, the shorter your range of motion gets. Now, there are times where a semi-sumo stance is appropriate. If you take a look at the right-hand picture of her, that's a semi-sumo stance. If you cannot keep your knees out in a traditional toes-to-plate sumo stance, you shouldn't be using it, because when your knees collapse in, well, that defeats the whole purpose of standing wide. Remember, we're standing wide so that we're holding our legs at a greater angle. When the knees collapse in, that angle 
uh, closes, right? And so if your knees are collapsed, it just it's just totally pointless. What ends up happening is that when your knees collapse, your hips shoot further behind the bar, and now what you've really got is a wide stance conventional deadlift, okay? And you got all the disadvantages of sumo with none of the advantages of conventional, meaning that your you know your knee angle and your hip angle are still more closed because you're in a sumo stance, but you're not as upright as you should be, and your hips are far away from the bar. So if you can't keep your knees out, you need to narrow your stance. So since we just started talking about knee position relative to stance width, let's just go full into knee position and discuss the implications for the deadlift. A lot of people just can't recognize, I guess, when people don't have their knees out on a sumo deadlift. To them, it just looks it looks kind of normal because uh, I guess you know you you can't really have your knees cave in the same traditional way that they do on a squat when you pull sumo because the bar's in the way. But if you take a look at the picture on the left. The knees are actually in a valgus position here. They are collapsed and they are caving. You need to get your knees out in the sumo deadlift for reasons we just talked about. If your knees are not out, you are lengthening the moment arm between the bar and the hips. You are presenting yourself with a more bent over back angle. You are basically putting yourself and like I said, a wide stance conventional deadlift where you get the worst of both worlds. You get the more closed knee and hip angle, which means your joints are at a more disadvantageous place to get the bar moving off of the ground, the hardest part of a deadlift. And you don't get the more upright back angle. You don't get the shorter lever arm. You just get a slightly shorter range of motion. And that's not really a good trade because you can get a shorter range of motion in the conventional deadlift without any of those problems just by rounding your back. So keep your knees out. It's critical. It's one of the most important technical aspects of the sumo deadlift. Knees out. So this puts us in a good position to start talking about foot position. In the conventional deadlift, foot position is really straightforward. I mean, you just need to point your toes out enough to get your hips through at the top. In the sumo deadlift, your foot position basically needs to facilitate your ability to get your knees out. The wider you stand, the more you're going to need to turn your foot to get those knees out, okay? So let's take a look at an example for both the conventional deadlift and the sumo deadlift. A lot of people try to do the conventional deadlift with their feet pointing straight ahead, and unless you have really good hip mobility, this is not a great idea because you can't fully flex your your glutes when your feet are completely pointed forward unless you have good mobility. So a really simple test is to just stand up, point your feet straight ahead, and flex your glutes as hard as you can and see if you can get your hips all the way through. See if you can fully extend them. If you can't, you should be noticing that your feet are trying to turn out to allow you to do that. And just notice the position that your feet are in when you let them turn so that you can get your hips all the way through. That's about what your conventional deadlift foot angle should be. You don't need to be able to hyperextend your hips, but you need to get full hip extension at the top. And like I said, you know, a slight angle of the foot, perhaps 15 degrees or so, for most people is really going to clean up their lockout. So make sure that your feet are pointed out at least a little bit on the conventional deadlift. Foot position or foot angle on the sumo deadlift is a little more complicated than the conventional deadlift, namely because you need to be able to get your knees out and the more forward your foot is pointed the more mobility and flexibility is going to be required to get your knees out okay so the primary limiting factor usually in getting your knees out is adductor flexibility and when you turn the foot it decreases the strain on the adductor and makes it easier for it to track out in line with the ankles now there's this is a trade-off and it can represent a problem if you turn your feet out too much because when you turn your feet out too much you decrease your uh you know your front to back stability it's a lot easier for you to tip forwards or backwards and in the sumo deadlift a lot of your weight is going back so this makes it a lot easier to end up losing your balance at the top of a deadlift and if you lose your balance on a deadlift and you take a step back or forwards your lift doesn't count so my recommendation is that you have your foot turned as far forward as you can for balance purposes while still being able to get your knees out. And this is going to vary for everyone depending on how wide they're standing for one and two, their own individual flexibility and mobility. A great place to start is at about 45 degrees. Most people are going to be within five degrees of that. Okay, but you might, 
you know, you might need to play around with it if you are one of the exceptions. The next thing I wanted to talk about is back angle, and this is really less of a technical pointer as it is just me clearing up a misconception that people have about the back angle in the sumo deadlift. Let's take a closer look. For whatever reason, a lot of people think that your back should practically be vertical if you're pulling sumo correctly, and this is really just not the case. Your back angle is determined by the things we've already talked about in the previous parts of this series. The bar needs to start over the middle of the foot, the scapulas need to be directly over the bar, right? And your hips are going to be at a certain height because your lats need to attach at that 90 degree angle to your humerus to most effectively keep the bar close. So realistically, the proper hip height in the deadlift is not up to you. You can't choose it. There's literally nothing that you can do given a certain stance width to make your hip height starting position, you know, where you want it to be. It's totally determined, predetermined by your anthropometry, by physics, and uh, just by the way that the system works. So a lot of people, for whatever reason, think that a sumo deadlift looks closer to something like the right-hand picture, where in the reality, it's going to look a lot more like the left-hand picture. And in fact, even there, I'm probably a little bit too vertical to represent what's going to happen with a heavier weight. Almost everybody with a heavier weight is going to have a back angle in somewhere at 30 to 45 degrees. For a conventional deadlift back angle might be anywhere from 20 to 30 degrees. But for some reason, people think that just by standing, you know, a couple feet wider, that it's going to allow you to have a back angle that's like the same as a squat. And that's just not what happens. Take a look at this picture of Dan Green. Obviously, a direct side angle would have been better here. But I just wanted to get, give you the, you know, the, the right idea that you can see his back angle is nowhere near vertical. I mean, it's about, a, it's about at 45, maybe 50 degrees there. It's, it's pretty upright and Dan's got great technique and he's doing a great job. But it's just not vertical. It's not even close. The hips are still high like they are in any deadlift, okay? Look at the hip height. I mean, it's right there for you. There's no way around the physics of the system here. A lot of people make a huge deal out of head position. I ultimately don't think that it makes a ton of difference to your performance, but it's another factor that can be optimized. So let's take a look at it and analyze it a bit. As I've already discussed in the other parts of this series, in order to efficiently transfer force, you need rigidness. You need something to be tight. That's why powerlifters are so obsessed with tightness and getting tight. When you have your head pointed directly down, you're putting your neck into flexion. So your spine is not rigid, right? There's a bend in it. When you hyperextend your neck, you're hyperextending your cervical spine. And again, the spine is not held in that rigid line of extension. The only time that the spine is held in that rigid extension and at its best peak ability to transfer force is with a neutral head position. Uh, and that's what you want to strive for on a deadlift. If, if your head kind of cranes up during the pull, it's not the end of the world. Usually it means you've gotten a little forward and your body is just trying to throw some more mass behind the bar to get you back on balance. So if you notice that you're throwing your head back on the pull or on the squat, usually you're a little forward. And, you know, it's, that's why your head is doing that. It's not because you, you're not cueing the right head position thing. It's because you messed up elsewhere in the, you know, the technical stream, so to speak. You got to fix that upstream rather than trying to fix it as it happens. But again, the optimal head position is going to be neutral. So we, before we move on and discuss the execution phase of the deadlift, I want to talk about how to optimize grip. So let's look at that. The first deadlift grip mistake that a lot of people make is they try to grip the bar like deep in their hand back in the palm. This just doesn't work because gravity ends up pulling the bar down into your fingers anyways. And if you grip the bar in your palm, it's going to take, it's going to pinch your skin and take a lot of the calluses along with it. This is one reason that guys have so many trouble ripping off calluses. They're not gripping the bar properly. The bar should be held at the base of your fingers because that's where it's going to roll to anyways when the weight gets heavy enough. Not only that, but if you think about it, when you're holding the bar in your fingers, it makes your arm effectively longer, right? Because if it's held in your fingers versus your palm, that might be another inch off of your range of motion. The second thing I want to talk about is how you lock your grip in, okay? A great trick that I got from Ricky Dale Crane, who pulled over 700 pounds as a 165er and said he had never had any trouble dropping deadlifts despite having a weak grip, 
is locking the your grip in using your nails rather than your fingers. So a lot of people will try to lock the bar in like on the picture on the right hand side there with their thumb overlapping one of their fingers. This closes the hand and on a heavy pull, your hand's gonna tend to be pulled open a bit anyways. And the advantage of locking in your grip with your thumb over your nails, especially if you chalk your nails and your thumb, is that your nails have way more friction than skin, okay? And because it's sitting in the, you know, the base of your fingers rather than, again, in your hand, your arm is going to be longer. Because there's more friction, the grip itself is actually stronger too. And this can really prevent or really help you to not lose as many pulls due to grip. So try locking in your grip with your thumb over your nails rather than over your fingers. The last grip related topic that I want to discuss is the hook grip. I actually think that the hook grip is the most efficient and best grip that you can use for powerlifting. So let's analyze why I think that's the case. So before I get too far ahead of myself, let me just actually talk about how you do the hook grip and why it works. With the hook grip, the thumb actually goes inside of the fingers, and what happens is because of this, the bar can't roll out of your hand, it just rolls into your thumb and smashes your thumb. So hook grip prevents the bar from rolling. Now, why do I think hook grip is better? So here's the thing. Take a look at both pictures here. What you're going to notice happening is that when the arms are double overhand, my triceps are not running into my lats. There's no interference there. But when the hands are turned supine, the tricep is driven into the lat. It runs into the lat. And so what ends up happening is this forces you, A, to take a wider grip, but B, it sort of pushes your underhand forward, which creates unevenness in the mixed grip. So not only do you have to take a slightly wider grip because of this, but usually that underhand pushes the bar forward a little bit and it, it just creates this unevenness and, and a windmilling effect that makes it much harder to have a straight bar path. With hook grip, you completely eliminate this problem. You get a closer grip and you don't get any of that tricep running into your lat. Now, the drawback with hook grip is that you need pretty big hands to use it. Usually, to be successful, you're probably going to need about an 8-inch hand. But people with smaller hands have made it work. You just have to invest in it from the very beginning and stick with it in the long term. Otherwise, your mixed grip will always be stronger. So if hook grip is something that you've never thought of before, or maybe if you have problems with that underhand, you know, do, do some investigation into the hook grip. It could really help your pulling efficiency. All right, now it's time to discuss a few things about the execution phase of the deadlift. Let's get to it. One of the most perplexing things that lifters do at the deadlift lockout is they do this weird hyperextension lean back thing that does absolutely nothing. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So on the left, you have a totally normal lockout that would be completely legal in any federation, standing straight up, shoulders are back, hips are through. But what a lot of lifters end up doing, I guess to really emphasize how much they locked it out, is they do this crazy lean back thing that you see on the right. Not only can you potentially get your lift red lighted for this because the knees are a little bit bent, not only does this not recruit any additional muscle at all because you haven't moved the bar against gravity or, at, I mean, it's just totally pointless muscularly, but what you're doing is you're hyperextending the spine under a load, and this puts you at risk for pinching something between your the facet joints of your spine. It's just a horrible idea. All it does is expose you to injury for no reason. So if you're one of those people that really likes to exaggerate and lean back on the lockout, stop doing that. It's bad for you. It does nothing good. Just stop. One of the main technical differences between sumo deadlifts and conventional deadlifts as far as execution goes is something that I alluded to earlier but didn't fully cover, and that's that in the sumo deadlift, you will actually run into problems if you try to extend your knees and hips at the same time during the lockout. In a conventional deadlift, that's just the standard way that things are done. But in the sumo deadlift, you really need to lock your knees out early. If you don't do this, what happens when the bar passes your knees is that as you go to push your hips forward, your knees will also shoot forward and you just sag. It's not as an efficient transfer when you push those hips forward, and it just doesn't work as well. The, I, the exact mechanism behind why this happens is not as necessarily as important as realizing that it does happen and that it's something you need to address. So I'm going to show you a rep out set that I did maybe a month ago 
where in the last few reps, I stopped locking my knees out early. And as a result, I got this weird knee sag that happens to sumo deadlifters when they don't get that early knee lockout. Take a look. So watch what happens here as the bar clears my knees and they're still not locked out and I go to push the hips forward. Notice how the knees shoot forward and I basically have to re-extend and do some weird crap to get the lockout to happen. Watch how much worse it gets on this one. If I ever actually pull the rep. All right, here we go. So when the bar clears the knees, they're not locked out. All, look at all the weird sorts of gyrations and things that I'm having to do. It's not good. So you really need to make sure you get in the habit of jamming those knees locked early in the movement. As soon as the bar crosses those knees, jam those knees locked. And then all the top of the sumo deadlift basically is, is a little half range of motion RDL where you push your hips forward three inches and the movement is over. But if you don't get those knees locked, when you go to push the hips forward, generally it throws your whole center of gravity forward too and the knees go forward along for the ride. So you gotta make sure that you jam those, those knees locked as soon as the bar crosses your knees. If you want a great example of a guy who just so consistent at this and just is, it's such perfect technique, look up Andre Bayev, okay? And I, I can't link it in, I can't put his um, actual deadlift in this video, but if you check out the article that I put in the description box, there's a video of him doing this near the bottom. Definitely check it out. He's the guy to study if you want to see picture perfect sumo deadlift technique. All right, so the last thing that I want to cover in this monster of a deadlift video is this whole idea of taking the slack out of the bar. Now, what does that even mean? Basically, taking the slack out of the bar is akin to Say you tied a rope to something, right? You tie a, or a piece of string, and you want to tug something around by that piece of rope. Until the rope is pulled taut, it's not going to transfer any of the force of your tugging. You're just wasting energy. Well, the same thing happens with a bar, particularly a deadlift bar. All bars have a little bit of flex to them. Depending on the bar, you know, if it's an Elico bar or a Vanco, it's going to have less, right? But if it's a Texas deadlift bar, it's going to have a ton. And until that flex gets pulled out, until the bar is taut, your force is not going to transfer to the bar. The initial force application will go into pulling the bar taut and getting that flex to come out. So it's a really good idea to just do it yourself. I'm going to go ahead and show you what this looks like in real life. Okay, so here's an old video of me pulling, I guess, 405 for 5, but it's on a deadlift bar, which is why I'm showing it to you. You're going to notice I'm going to do some like rhythmic rocking type stuff, but what I really want you to notice is the height of the bar in between my shins. Because what I'm doing is I'm trying to time pulling the slack out of the bar with my little air hump slash dip things. So what, I, what, so what I'm trying to do is time my dip with pulling the slack out to almost sort of lever the bar up. I don't think this actually works, but at the time it was something I was trying to do. So... What I, what I really want you to pay attention to, though, is watch all this, how much slack you can pull out of a deadlift bar. Pulling the slack out of the bar is mostly something that you should be concerned with if you're uh, pulling on a deadlift bar that has a lot of flex, but it's really something that everybody should know how to do And it's really something that you should do on every single pull because again until that bar is tight You're not getting force transfer. So pull the slack out of the whole system that includes your body and the bar Well guys and gals that concludes the technique series be on the lookout for my next series on powerlifting gear that's coming up I hope that was a helpful video. If you have any questions about any of the videos, please ask I read every comment I answer every question there's a few tips and tricks that I left out of this article, like namely how to use baby powder optimally. If you want to read some about, some about that, like how to use baby powder, check out the article in the description box. It goes into a little bit more detail in this video, if that's even possible. Again, I hope that was helpful. Have a good one, and remember to check out powerliftingwin.com for more great powerlifting information. Bye-bye.